All right, what a great song. Okay, well, I'm excited about uh, the year of grace. Uh, I've always uh, looked into grace, but I realize the more now I'm looking into it, it's almost like you don't realize how much grace is woven in the scriptures. Have you ever thought about buying a car that you never thought about and you're thinking about it and you're looking into it and then you're driving on the road and you're realizing how many of those cars are driving by but you never paid attention before? You know what I mean? Like if you're looking for a car and you're looking into a certain model, then all of a sudden as you're driving you start seeing, you start realizing they're all around. And it's the same thing kind of when you focus on the word and our theme in the church this year is is a year of grace because we want to really study it out and ask God to help us understand more and more how each of us can be moved and motivated and inspired by his divine influence. Uh, we don't have to work for it. We don't have to earn it. But, we, but, but, but it does influence us to live as though we're working for it or earning it, but we don't need to. Um, Ray Lynn uh, did a great job, I heard, sharing for the women. And so did, so did our awesome sister, Janice. And then, of course, my beautiful wife did an incredible job. But Ray Lynn uh, made an analogy, I heard, that uh, we're, we're servants of God. And he told the women, you're servants of God, but you're also daughters of God. So you're not like just a servant in a servant quarters being paid. You're a servant that lives in the main house. And even if you didn't want to serve, your father would still love you. He'd probably try to help you change your character because you're not going to do well when you go out into the world if you're not doing anything. Yeah. But he would still love you the same. Yeah. He wouldn't fire you. And kick you out. So we are servants of God, but we are daughters and sons of God. Amen. So, yes, we want to we want to make our dad happy. We want to help out and do our chores. We want to help move his kingdom and help motivate and be used by him. Right. And when you're in like that, you're fired up. I want to uh, share with you the, uh, uh, what we're doing is a year of grace, but also uh, I'm going to keep weaving the scripture, and you don't need to go there, but Romans 10, 17 says, consequently, faith comes through reading the message, and the message is the word of Christ, word of God. So where does faith come from? Reading the Bible. It doesn't come from anything else. You can be contributed to by that. The Bible says in Romans, you can look at the stars and the moon and the, the bugs and the vegetation and even look at your own human body and go, how did, this is unbelievable. Yeah. And, and, and God says we're without excuse to believe that there's a God. That's where it starts. Right. But to feed your faith, if you're not feeding your faith in God's word daily, you, you don't understand. Yeah. Because faith, you're saved by grace, it's a gift. But you, to have the grace, you've got to have great faith. Amen. And to be motivated by the grace, you've got to feed your faith. And then to be able to help others, you need to have something to give to them because you can't give them grace. You can show them and tell them how you have access to it through God, through Christ. So you have to have faith. So you have to get faith every day and continue to feed faith from the source, the word, consequently, Faith comes through the message, and the message is in the Word of God, Word of Christ. Yeah. So if you don't read your Bible, Jay, why wouldn't you want to fuel your faith? Because if you're telling someone scriptures and truth, but you're not walking with God with your own tank full of faith, mm -hmm. it's like singing a song that someone loves, but you're off key. Oh, wow. So you're singing the words, and, and you go, oh yeah, I know that song, but don't sing anymore. Because I know the song, but it just doesn't sound right. So you're telling people Jesus died for you on the cross and God loves you. And, and they're like backing up going, because it's like you're regurgitating facts, which are powerfully true, but the vibe's coming out with no faith. Because God, if, otherwise, because God says he doesn't need us. If God, God designed his plan for, for flesh and blood, imperfect people that have been divinely influenced by grace to carry the message to other people that don't understand salvation, and bring the truth in the Bible and help them understand, but communicate and demonstrate how we're trying to love and grow and change. Amen. Also share your, 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 your weaknesses. Yeah. And that's how he works. He says, I'm going to use flesh and blood to, to communicate my message. 
But if we don't fill ourselves up with faith, we're just giving truth that can hurt people. Because yeah. love has to be in the message. And full grace, you know, Jesus came full of grace and truth. You can't just have truth and then a little bit of grace. Because right. now you're going to hurt people. Come on. Amen? The, uh, our, our, if you're, our, 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 we have, I gave the church three resolutions, you, and you guys can have your own resolutions, but the church's resolutions are what really God wants us to do, and we have this passed out, and this will be up on our website. On. The, first re revolution, the first resolution is become more useful to your master. Amen. You know, the Bible says in a large house there are articles in 2 Timothy 2.20. In a large house, there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also wood and clay. Some are for special purposes and some for common use. Those who cleanse themselves from the latter will be instruments for special purposes, made holy and useful to the master and prepared to do any good work. Wow. Paul here is urging Timothy to be the kind of person Christ would use for his noblest purposes here. Don't settle for less than God's highest and best. Amen. Allow him to use you as an instrument of his will. Come on. You do this by staying close to him and keeping yourself pure so that sin and its consequences do not get in the way of what God could do in your life. Because when you allow sin to come in your life, it derails you and then there's usually bad consequences which distracts and takes you out. And you can still, the grace is still there, but you're just immobilized by the drama that's been caused by your bad choices. And your heart gets messed up. You got to get pulled back in. We love you and we're going to love you. We'll help you talk about it. Let's get your heart up. Let's do the word God love you. And then you're back in the ball game. But for a couple of weeks, you're kind of walking around Mopey Joe. We're trying to help you. Oh. I've been there too. That's, that's kind of the message of helping each other. We don't judge, but we help each other. But so we strive not to sin, become useful to the master. You know, God can redeem any situation, but how much better is it to stay close to Christ yes. and ready to be used by him at a moment's notice? That's when you're in the grace. Yeah. You're reading your word. You're going to God. You're rebuking these things we're going to talk about today. So you can be ready like a, like a Navy SEAL on call. Woo. You know, in the military, we were in Italy, in the new, and we were, uh, I was a, uh, on an anti-terrorist security group and we lived in a little mountain on a mountain called Mount Calvarina in Italy but we had to have apartments down in the towns in Italy because it was such a small base so you know they usually as a private you wouldn't get off but they let me down into the uh, town so I got an apartment with an Italian guy that was an officer and you know it was incredible but we had to be ready within like two hour notice we had to have a duffel bag and everything ready to go we had we would uh, have beepers and if they beeped us, we had to be willing, we had to be up back up at the base within two hours, ready to go. And it could be a drill or it could be an emergency, but we had to be up there ready at any moment's notice. So you're in the restaurant, you're out there, whatever. That means you can't be drinking, you can't be drunk. You gotta be focused. Come on. That's what you want to be with God. Amen. It says you're prepared to do any good work. That means are you ready to be used by him at a moment's notice or you got to, oh gosh, I'm not there spiritually, I'm not ready. Now you start getting serious about God. No, you stay serious about God and everything else is awesome. Yes. Second one is be a willing, effective worker. In uh, Matthew 9, 34, and everybody has a hand out there, it says, but the Pharisee says, it is by the prince of demons that he drives out demons. And I put that verse in there before on purpose because they're telling Jesus, they're saying Jesus is a demon. And Jesus went through the, all the towns and villages, driving in, uh, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out the workers into the harvest field. Either you're harassed and helpless or you found God and now you understand grace and now you're divinely influenced by your shepherd. Jesus is Lord. So you're only either or. So if you've gotten through the helpless and harassed part and you found God, Jesus is Lord, now God's praying for you to be a worker. You're in the church, you're in his church, but are you a worker? 
He says the harvest, guys, guess what? There's a lot of people out there that are are waiting for you to share how God changed your life. There's a lot that will say no, but the harvest still is plentiful. The workers are few. He says, God, pray for each other in here to be a worker for the Lord. Your purpose is to be a fisher of men and women. To use your success and your abilities as a platform to bring the characteristics of Christ and you learn to trust God, but ask God to, to, to help you make the most of every opportunity. Amen? Amen? And that would be studying your Bible diligently and knowing the elementary teachings of the scriptures to be able to answer questions when people sit down with you and go, what is a Christian? How do I know the Bible is the word of God? What the kingdom, what is that? Is it here? Is it there? Where's the kingdom? Light and darkness. What is that, a Star Wars movie? No, I understand. What what, what do you mean light and darkness? What's the Bible talk about being in the light, being in darkness? And where am I? I I, want to know. The cross. Well, we all know Jesus died on the cross, but let's accurately go through firsthand scripturally the, the, what Jesus really went through verbatim in the scriptures. The church. Wow, that's a big confusion. Which church do I go to and how do I know this church is condoned by God? Or that church is condoned by God? Every church just with Jesus' name on it doesn't mean it's necessarily correctly teaching. And then the third one is be a generous giver. And it says in 2 Corinthians 9, Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for the food will also supply the increase and, and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. Now listen to this. He says, Now he, God, he supplies the seed to the sower, that's you working, and the bread for food, and he will also supply and, and increase your store of seed, which would be your bank account, your life. Yeah. He's gonna, God's going to increase it, not you. And it says, and he will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness, meaning you're going to be harvesting a lot of souls. You're going to be used. How God gives you wealth and and influence, if your focus is to save souls and be a light to the world, you're going to use whatever God gives you as a platform, as gratitude, not just to get more and more. You're not the person with the most toys dies. There used to be a sticker that says, the one with the most toys wins. The one who dies with the most toys wins. There was, a skip, there was a sticker that was popular years ago. It's like, get my stuff, get me, get me, get me. No, God says, use everything I give you to reap a harvest of righteousness. And he goes, and then look what it says in verse 11. You will be enriched in every way. Okay, wow, God, how can that happen? God just says, put me first and trust me and watch this happen. Every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. God is saying, I'm setting you up to be generous on every occasion. So you can go, but well, wait a minute. I don't, I, no, no, you have to live your life for God. And I can't explain it except God has control of everything. He'll work it out. On, He's saying, I want you to be able to be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will, re- will result in thanksgiving to God. Definition of generous. In a way that shows a readiness to give more of something, especially money, than is necessary or expected. Bible talks about God as a generous God. Tithing is in the Old Testament. It's not brought up in the New Testament except don't go less, don't go back. Jesus says don't get it. Jesus says give up everything. And Jesus' theme is be generous. God is going to be generous. And you've got to figure out what that means to you. And that's, that takes me to my next thing. Here is our crown of thorns project we are a movement of the international christian churches we aren't just orlando like i said 65 were just sent down to miami we planted tampa and gainesville uh, and uh, houston and we sent out leaders to lead the boston church so each church does their part but this is what we've done so far and if you see these churches in green those are all the church plantings that have happened uh, in uh, nine years and the, the, the ends of the earth, these, these international cities, are really what most people would say in the world are the most influential cities in the world. And they just so happen to circle the globe as a crown of thorns. That's why we call it the crown of thorns. If you looked at all these cities on the globe, they kind of go around the world. But if you see Santiago, that was in 2009. London, 2010. Sao Paulo, 2011. Mexico City, 2012. 
Paris, 2012. Sydney, 2014. Chennai, 2014. We're getting ready to uh, plant New Delhi next year. Um, Moscow, 2015. Manila, 2015. Lagos, Nigeria, 2016. Dubai, 2016. Hong Kong, 2017. Now these churches are considered crown of thorn churches, which means they're, 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 they're pillar churches around the world. People would call these cities, now, we're, now the leaders there will be building there because those cities really have a, a diverse uh, racial population of that part of the world where they're gonna, where they're gonna reach out and, and convert many, many people like we're trying to do everywhere. And then they'll be raising up churches and sending out in that part of the world and going out and trying to get to the ends of the earth as God calls us to do while we're alive. And when we meet people that have already become disciples, that's just less we got to get. But we're going to follow the plan as though that's all we know because that's what God says to do. And there's plenty of people to reach out just in Orlando, right? Yes. You see phase two, that's what we're doing, and phase three. And then you see, I'm really excited about this as well. We call this Operation Eagle. All right. Now we just made that name up. Because we, you know, it's, it's, you, can, you can do that. The church in the Bible is called the church in the way. I mean, not in the way, on the way. Uh, you know, God's church. It's just, it's just a, a signal of what we're trying to do. What are we trying to do? Well, it's, it's, it's all, we're trying to plan and we have the right to decide as leaders how we can accomplish Jesus' command of making disciples of all nations. Right? Well, Operation Eagle is a planned evangelization of the USA and to have a, a, a church, a sold out movement, a church in every state. We have four in Florida. We have like four or five in LA. New York has some boroughs, but right now we have you know, 17 states planted and we're gonna have 33 more because there's a lot of people out there that don't understand true discipleship, amen? So this is incredible and we're hoping, that, you know, it, it, all this is God willing, spirit willing. We commit it to God and the spirit goes and, and we're really trying to do that. And if God switches directions or something comes up, we go, you know, we continue to do the work, but these are on target. Albuquerque, New Mexico, the team's already been selected and they are going. So there you see, there's one there. So that's going to do it. But, uh, you know, it excites a lot of us that have family members that don't go to church or don't know the truth. So it is exciting. Amen. Yeah. So guys, let's be praying about it. See, God's church is universal. It's around the world, but we got to teach the truth correctly. Amen. Turn your Bibles to Titus 2, verse 11. Right. In verse 11, it says, The grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and to worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope and appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself up for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. These then are things you should teach, encourage, and rebuke with all authority. Let no, do not let anyone despise you. Grace, the title of the lesson is Grace Teaches Us to, to Say No to Sin. Not threats. Not warnings. There's warnings in the scriptures. There's promises of God about the future of judgment, and there will be, a, the majority won't be in heaven, Jesus says, few will find it. The road is wide. But God says that if you divinely are touched by his grace, you're not going to have to be forced or convinced or held accountable and beg to read your Bible and come to church and don't sin again. You're going to actually start to kick in the truth. And it's going to motivate you. And, and, and the Bible does say we have discipling relationships. That's the one another scriptures. We call it discipleship. Love one another as I've loved you. So discipling means we, we, when people come in the church, most people that go through a series of uh, scriptural teachings that we have uniformly through the whole movement of the church, it's a tool. Because in today's controversy of churches, there's many misunderstandings about really true Christianity as Jesus defines it in the Bible. Right. 
And there was different things in the time of the scriptures. You'll read different issues that came up back then. But right now there's false doctrines that weren't around before the 1800s that are here now. So we have to address those because so many, even of us, grew up sincerely believing something that we were taught that had truths of of the Bible, but but man traditions kind of came in over the centuries and were were exalted evenly with the scriptures. And before everybody knew it, that's just truth. But no one stopped, but people didn't get into the Bible and we're not teaching the Bible one-on-one as we were in the first century church. We need to have first century Christianity today. And we don't massage it, we don't add to it, we don't bring in people's writings. We, we, we can make decisions on opinions on how to accomplish the commands of the scriptures. Meeting on Sunday at 10, it doesn't say that. But, but someone has to call the play. Yeah. Coming together, the Bible says they devoted themselves to one another. They met every day. They were very, there was unity that needed to be forged. Come on. So we do that. Here it says here, say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. Well, why don't you say no? Why does the majority of the world say not say no? Why did I go around for 30 years saying yes to ungodliness and worldly passions? If it feels good, I'm doing it. Why why do we all do that? Why do we even do that now? Why do we make a decision to violate God's word and disobey him when we know it? Grace we need. And hopefully when you see that and you do blow it, you'll get in touch with God's divinely influencing you not to control you, to try to convince you that what you're doing is like punching yourself in the face. Sin is destructive, but it comes off glamorous and clever and sophisticated up front. Being wealthy and having many things and being in yourself and being in control, be a power guy. Or, 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 or sleeping around. It, it, it can seem, you, you can brag about that stuff. But you don't understand how it ends up with a lot of miles of bad road when you finally get in touch with it. Let's look at, um, let's look at uh, Romans chapter 2, verse 4. And you know, as we get ready to move it, 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 from that scripture in Titus, it also says, uh, as he purifies us, we become a people who, that are his very own, eager to do what is good. You know, that's another sign of grace. You're eager. You're not, you're not having to be convinced. You're just eager to be on board. You're eager to be, to be part of God's church. You're eager, eager to follow and submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. You know what I mean? You're eager. You don't have to be convinced. You don't have to be talked into it. You're like, amen, let's do this. In Romans chapter 2, verse 1. We read here, Therefore, You have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same things. Now you, now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere human, kind of really puts us in our place, doesn't it? Once in a while, you a mere human. You're just a mere human. I'm a mere human. You, a mere human, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things. Do you think you'll escape God's judgment? It says, or do you do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, for forbearance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? See, guys, the problem we have is that we fix our eyes on other people. And you know what? We actually sometimes even subconsciously make a standard of comparing ourselves to other people even in the church. And then we feel good about ourselves. Ridiculous. You're a fool if you're doing that. You mere human. How dare you judge? Now the Bible says are we to judge those outside the the church? No. But it does say in Corinthians, we are to judge those inside. And Paul actually in 1 Corinthians 5 says, expel the wicked brother among you, have nothing to do with them. So they actually put someone outside the church for not repenting. Yeah. The Bible is very clear that there's church discipline and there's warnings and, and encouragement to please repent. Please repent. And if they continue to defy the word of God and go disobey, there has to be steps to take place. And it's always out of love. But eventually you can disfellowship someone, which is not permanent, 
But there, and, that, and if you don't know your Bible, you can say that sounds unjust. No, we worked with that person and they're still adorable, but they refuse to repent. And we can't let someone defiantly, who is a Christian, just stay in defiant sin in good standing in this church. It's like putting oil in water. If they repent, we'll help them. But judgment, fix your eyes on Jesus, not on somebody else. And judgment, I believe we can use a word more like if you're in judgment, because we all make judgments. We all make judgments every day. And it necessarily it's not bad. You make a judgment on parking your car. You're pulling up and looking at that space and you've got to make a judgment. Can I really fit in there without dinging my door or their door? And sometimes you're stressed and you're pushing being late and you actually convince yourself that you can fit in there. And then when you're backing up and backing in and backing up and backing in and, and, and there's people behind you and you can see their stress already and swearing four letter words up at the ceiling and you're backing up and backing in and you take like five minutes and you get like three fourths away and then you finally realize this isn't gonna work. And then you back out and then you have to drive around six more times to look for a bigger spot. That's a judgment. You made, a fault. you made an error. You did not make a great judgment. You, didn't, you said, I could get in there, but you really couldn't. So now you had to make another judgment to fit into a bigger spot. Oh, but judgment is normal. But judgment of one another is not. It says, why are you judging someone else? Wow. Even if you don't ever struggle with it, who are you? You don't understand grace. Yeah, you may be naturally strong in an area that someone just is the derelict of derelicts and cannot and keeps blowing. You're like, what is wrong with you? Because it's easy to pass judgment on someone that's weaker or not doing well in an area that you just naturally or, or easily do better. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard, but you still need to be caring about people. And you need to know if you get in someone's life, you can tell whether they know the truth or not. Because if you become a friend with someone, you can see their way of life and you can realize there's probably something, the pattern of life of a disciple is pretty recognizable. Yeah. So you do need to go, hey, I, I think this person, I'm going to reach out to this person. But you're not saying, you're not the judge, you're just going, I think this person may not know God through, through Christ the way that the Bible teaches. So now you got to do it out of love and just you share and say, we'd like to come to church. Or we'd like to some scriptures and you always try to use yourself. You evaluate. I evaluate a brother in the church if I see he's not doing well. I don't I, I evaluate him, though, with the attitude of like, only can I help him? Not like, good night. Can this dude get it together? Yeah. No, I'm like, I'm concerned about this guy. And don't get me wrong. There's times where I could go, good night. Can this guy get together? And then I go, God, please forgive me. Who am I a past judgment? Because, you know, we're self-righteous. Yeah. But then I have to realize before I go to that guy, my heart's got to be, I'm only going out of love and help. Amen. I'm not going out of anything about me. Amen. And God forbid that, God, God, for the grace of God, I may not be struggling with that right now. Amen. But I'm going to help. Yeah. On, God's kindness leads to repentance. How's that doing with you? The Bible says, His patience... His perseverance leads you to repentance. But he, but he says, or are you showing contempt for the riches? Contempt is rebellion. Contempt is willful, open disrespect for God, for his word, for people, for authority. That's contempt. Yeah. And, and you're throwing contempt to the riches of his kindness. And that means you're confused. Look in, um, you know, look in verse 5. It goes on, it says, Because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God will repay every person according to what they have done. To those by persistence in doing good, seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for the, those who are self-seeking and reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. So we see there's two sides to that. The only thing you're stopping yourself from is stubbornness, which would be pride or unrepentance. Yeah. Stubbornness is just, that's what the face looks like. <laughs> you're not convinced. You're not being persuaded. And that's why we need to use the Bible. Amen. And then it's not personal. You're showing someone the Bible, and if they're stubborn, you can say, you know, you seem, what, what's bothering you? 
you seem like we just read that, what's going on? And then, and then you need to bring it back in to, to the Bible, to God, not you. If you allow yourself to be humble before God, you're going to allow yourself to be humble before men. You're going to seek to listen to what is being said instead of looking, who, looking at who is saying it. Because if it doesn't come out the way you think it should have come out, maybe that person needs a little bit more teaching on how to be more socially skilled. But if there's truth to it from God, you should go, all right, I'm going to just own that. Look in um, Luke seven thirty six. Great. In point number one, grace teaches us to love much. Grace teaches us to love much. How would you say you are at loving people? We know the standard now, right? Jesus in John 13, 34 and 35 says a new command I give you, not even an option. Love one another as I've loved you. So you must love one another. By this all men will know you're my disciples if you love one another. So it's a command. If you want to be right with God, this isn't even, this isn't even not even up for negotiation. You, this is a command. You need to work at it. And you don't love like your family taught you to love or you love. It doesn't mean they did, did a bad job. But just no one is at Jesus' standard. Yeah. But here we see in verse 36, it says, When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in the town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw all this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is. She is a sinner. She, Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. And I want to just put something out here. In verse 39, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, yet it's broadcast in word. Isn't that awesome? It's just God's little insights going, I hear everything and everything is going to be recorded. He said to himself and Jesus is in there. So he was in his mind. That was a mental vulnerable thing. It wasn't like going, no, no, no. he said in his mind. He said just what we read. He says, mind, Jesus right next to him. And we allow it to be recorded just to remind us once again, God Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him give account. Isn't that powerful, though? When the Pharisee who invited him saw this, he said to himself, no, 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 in his mind. And then, then Jesus turns to him, golden discipling opportunity. Simon, I have something to tell you. And look at him, he's all eager and fired up. Tell me, teacher, he said in front of everybody. Tell me, teacher. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You judged correctly, Jesus said. Simon was probably like, yeah, baby. He looked at his guest. How you doing? <laughs> but then he continues. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, you see this woman? And, and, he, and Jesus in his mind is probably going, I know you saw the woman because you thought some already judgmental things about her when she came in. And I read your mind. You did not give me water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. For whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven, because Jesus had the power on earth to forgive sins. The other guests began saying to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. She had access to grace there. The key here is whoever has been forgiven little loves little. So if, you've been, if, you, think, if you think God didn't need to forgive you that much, you're deceived. 
you're, 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 you are a deep sinner. And once again, if you don't realize that, you're comparing to others or the standard of the word. And we compartmentalize sins in the Bible. We do. We look at the sinner that comes in as the drug, alcoholic, womanizer, immoral, wretch, drug problem guy. Sometimes worse than the person that uh, just told some fibs and went to church all their life and, but really wasn't a disciple. I feel sorry for sometimes, I actually, I, I don't feel sorry, but I'm saying, I'm grateful I was the worst. In my eyes, I see myself as the worst. It was just easier for me when I had that moment, an opportunity that God allowed me through grace to even be in a position where I was humble to at least to go to church and listen and get in a Bible study. And I was humble enough, and I can't even take credit, that God allowed me to be in a place where I could go. I, I, here's me. In 1990, at four in the morning, looking for white little specks on the carpet because I ran out of Coke. So I'm looking, and I'm taking Lent, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm uh, snorting probably Lent and stale cereal or anything. That's me by myself, out of my mind, crawling on my living room, no one seeing me but God seeing me, and walking around going, just trying to find one last bit of coke because I'm too wasted to go get more and I don't need more money. So I'm looking for any white, oh, there's a white speck right there. See that? That's exactly what I would have done. I would have picked that white speck up and I would have put it on the table and just tried to see if it was, like maybe I, maybe I was sloppy. That might be a little bit more. Like a, look at this. I'm a, am I in the mud as the prodigal son? Am I in the mud? Is, is, can you get any lower than that? That was me in 1990. Run out of cigarettes. Just look back in the ashtray, take one that maybe had a little bit left because I'm so amped, I just light that again. And, you know. and then I need to go to sleep. How do I sleep when the birds are starting to chirp and I'm way, wired out of my mind? Well, let's go in and slap down the NyQuil. And some Psalmonex. Probably don't even realize I'm playing with my heart in a big way. Die. Now, I don't know how you guys are looking at that, and maybe you can't experience that depth of depravity in that area, but that was, that was me. That was just one of me's. There's been other me's in 19, when I was 20, kicking a door in with a stocking over my face and putting a gun in someone's face and taking all the drugs. And then so wired out of my mind after I stole the drugs that I almost had a heart attack. There's another me in Italy uh, laying on the floor in Montecchio, Montecchio, a small little Italian town when I'm off duty and I mistakenly thought it was cocaine and it was heroin and cocaine and I was on the floor and no one was there in my apartment and I was trying to keep myself awake in the middle of a little town in Italy that no one knew I was in the apartment. My family, everybody would have got called and said, your son's dead. And I was trying to keep myself awake on the floor by myself. My girlfriend had left and she didn't do that stuff. And she didn't know, and I didn't know until I did it because I didn't understand the language when I went and bought it, that it was mixed. So I, when I realized I was starting to go out, I realized this is, uh, this is not a good feeling. And I'm, I'm trying to keep myself awake on the floor. And all I remember was I got to keep myself awake. And then I ended up waking up the next afternoon. But I thought I was going to die if I fell asleep. So I thought I was going to die at that time. Look in uh, um, 1 Timothy chapter 1. What about you? What are some things that you've done that you're not proud of? And I'm not trying to match sins. I'm just trying to say, are you in touch? See, I'm the worst of the worst. Because I get what Paul's going to say here. It says, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to be to his service, even though I was once a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent man. I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, although with the faith, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The grace of our Lord, he says, was poured out on me abundantly. That's divine influence. Divine influence in the heart. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves ex full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I'm the worst. But for this very reason I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display immense patience 
as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul did not go around and take a survey with every disciple he met in town and try to say, what are your sins? And, and compare and say, yep, I'm still the worst. I've got it. I've got it. I'm still the worst. He just understood before God that sin separates him, and he took responsibility for him and didn't compare to anybody else. Yeah. But he realizes that all sin, all fall short, all sin and fall short of the glory of God. You're done. You don't, you don't have God anymore. You never were with God. The poly purebreds, the grandma that you thought always just baked cookies and was impossible of doing wrong, the good moral life person without Jesus is not saved. That doesn't make sense to us and humanistically. How could that person be? The, that's not your decision. Grace is a decision from God. And God chooses who he wants to give it to. Yeah. And, it, and you can't justify it. God, guess what? I am going to give it to him. Wait a minute. The, one of the greatest examples of grace that doesn't make any human sense because we're all earn it and be productive is the thief on the cross. Now, this is in the Old Covenant, and there's a lot of misunderstandings about this because people go, well, why didn't he get baptized? Because he was in the Old Covenant. Jesus had not died yet. He was like the Jews that died yeah. in the Old Testament, faithful, believing in the Messiah. Yeah. But he was on the cross, and it doesn't even give us enough. As readers, as judgmental people we can be, we want more. to just, we, he, we know we believe Jesus did that, but I don't know about you. When I first read I want a little bit more. How did you, that guy's, he's... Today you're going to be in paradise? I mean, where's the, where's the, uh, we repent? Where, where, you didn't even draw him out. He didn't do a sin list. He didn't do nothing. Well, we know God knows everything. And Jesus pierced right into his heart. And we know the man admits enough to say, he, he stops the other guy from uh, cutting him down. And he, sa and he says, we, we belong to be here. We should be here. We're guilty. And he's hanging there dying. First of all, when you're hanging there dying, if you're arrested for a crime and you're sentenced, most, you know, you can go in prisons all over the place and they'll still tell you they didn't do it. And unfortunately, there's a small percentage that are put in prison and didn't do it. And I can't even imagine how terrible that is. But people that even go to their death sentence, and this isn't about advocating either way, they say even uh, the toughest guy when he's getting ready, when it's over, and they're getting ready to inject him or electrocute him, they will cry like babies and start weeping out and screaming they don't want to die. See, the thief, just a moment, you should look at it. It's not even in every gospel. I think it's just in John, actually, when it says, and the thief, he looks at him, he says, today remember me in your kingdom. And Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. And before that, he just makes a comment, we should be here. We deserve what we're getting. So the pathetic depravity of that man's life summing up, he probably summed it up. I don't know where his family was or whatever, but he probably, when you're living a life of sin, he has a mind just like us. He, you feel bad, but when you do sins like that, you destroy relationships. If you've had a drug addict or an alcoholic issue in your family, you know how much it hurts people, even if you weren't the one. It hurts everyone. Yeah. You hurt people. He hurt people. He came from a mother. He came from, didn't say anything. We know somehow, some way in his consciousness, he's like, is this it? Is, I'm, I, and why was he allowed to be next to the savior of the world on that day of execution? He would have been hung anyway on the cross. Crucifixion was normal. Because God looked in his heart and said, your whole life, probably 99% of it, doesn't deserve to be in heaven. Your last little lip service, I can see is not lip service. But you know what? It doesn't even matter what anybody else thinks. I'm God and I'm going to let you know you're with me. And the man still died. God didn't do a miracle and get him off the cross. The woman who washed Jesus' feet, it insinuates she was a prostitute, insinuates that she had sex for money because of the way people talked about that. I'm a prostitute. I slept with women. I didn't charge them, but there was something else I wanted. 
I wanted not them, I didn't want that personal, human, emotional, caring, loving friendship. That's actually the last thing I wanted. I wanted to have feelings for me. I wanted to have me satisfied. And when I'm done, I don't want your number. But I'll take it, but I'm not calling you. But I'm not telling her that. Because I don't want to hang. I'm a prostitute. I'm a prostitute for many things. Anytime you work an angle for anything and your motive is impure or wrong, you're prostituting. So be careful not to throw judgment. The God, can, God commended this woman. She wasn't invited to that party, by the way, to that household. She burst in. And she knew going there that she must have heard because Jesus was preaching around. She knew there's hope in that room. I've heard a little enough to go that if that's God, I am not going to worry what others think. See, in here, we still worry about what others think. And it stops us from moving forward. And by the way, we're all going to a movie. I invited everybody and I'm inviting all you. As many people want to come, we're going to that movie, The Greatest Showman at, at 520 at Fashion Square. So if you want to join us and bring your family, it's a family friendly event, but it's so inspiring. And it shows some real parallels to things. So yeah, we're going to meet at 5 o'clock at Fashion Square for The Greatest Showman. It starts at 520. Everybody come. The, the, but that woman didn't know what made her walk in there with all men, all self-righteous, prominent Pharisees, to open the door. You ever open the door to somebody, even if you're invited to a party by your friend? Say, hey, just look for me. And you walk in, and you're kind of already kind of uncomfortable. No one knows you. You're like, hey, I'm a friend of uh, Frank's. Is he here? And, uh, I don't know. Frank, and you're walking through everybody. <laughs> no one knows you. Walk into that situation as her, and everybody already knows her, and in their minds, they're looking at her with scowls and go, You little whore, what are you doing here? And she doesn't worry. She gets on her, feet, on her knees and uses her hair, and then that, that alabaster perfume she probably used to entice men. Now she's using it for a very beautiful thing. Because that alabaster perfume was very expensive. So she probably, you know, knocked it out, went out and tried to track, you know, the, the men for a deal. Now she uses it for Jesus and gives it to the Son of God. And gives it all to the Son of God. And weeps. Because she cannot, like what Devon said, the indescribable gift. She couldn't do anything else to express. There was nothing else. How, could, how much more grateful? She couldn't give enough gratitude. She was weeping, using her own hair to wash his feet, and weeping with her tears for the water. I mean, she wanted to do more. I think she probably needed to realize she was so grateful she couldn't be stopped or distracted by what anybody else thinks. She fixed her eyes on Jesus, and we're going to close out with this scripture. Look at this scripture. You know why? Because if she... As she lived her life, she had so much shame. In any sin you do, you have shame. The good you ought to do and you don't do it, you're in sin. Your conscience violates you. Even atheists that don't do the right things hurt themselves. Because God created them, they don't even know that. This woman probably had three, four, who knows how many men she would be with a day. Degrading herself and feeling like a worthless piece of trash and those men tried to probably, she was probably worked over, probably abused, and maybe not paid at times. What's she going to do? Go tell the police? And just left there like a little tramp doll. And she allowed it and entered into it, but there was nothing else. She was in this thing. How shameful and degraded do you feel when there's no way out, and you have no hope, and you hear about this Son of God that's bringing salvation and grace to the world. And all you did is hear a little bit about it because you probably couldn't get too close to the crowd because everybody looked at you. You shouldn't be here. And she just finally went. And when you know the grace is waiting there, you're going to run through a wall. When you know you can get right with God, nothing stops you. When you know the word of God is being laid out and people are waiting to answer all your questions and show you by their life and the word's going to answer, the schedule gets cleared. 
um, what, 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 what's next? When I was studying the Bible, when I realized I wasn't saved, I was like, when can we do the next study? They had to slow me down. They were worried about me because, you know, I was using cocaine, drinking, smoking dope, smoking cigarettes, sleeping with women. I was like, when's the next study? And I remember later I heard that they were getting advice from the leadership and they were saying, slow down. And I understand that because they, they thought, you know, this guy might, you know, he's got to get off these drugs. And I did. I call, stopped cold turkey and everything. And I prayed all day and all night, and that's where I learned prayer. No one taught me prayer in church. They showed me that because outside the church is where I go, I need to see the power of God because I ain't going to make it. I'm going to have to go to rehab. I go, you got to show me something, please, because I really want to do this. But show me you're real. Don't show me a church organization because I was kind of struggling with that stuff. And that's where I always go back, and I have to remember even at times, prayer is powerful outside here no one should see you praying you should be praying on your knees and giving glory to god and asking god to mold you and to, and, and and conform you and move you as he wants anywhere he wants any way he wants you'll break your dreams if his dream calls you another way that's what grace does and then you got to go i trust god because he doesn't want to hurt you or leave you abandoned he loves you but he, you don't understand the higher purpose. So look in Hebrews chapter 12, 1. Last night I was sitting on the couch and working on my lesson. It was kind of late and my daughter came out for a moment. She was working on something. and I just looked up at her with the dog next to her. She, wasn't, she was busy. And I said, I love you. And she looked back up at me and went, I love you too. I don't see anything wrong in her. That's the way I need to look at you guys. I don't see anything wrong in you. I see what you can be always. That's the way we need to look at each other. And then if you are just confused or just concerned, like why aren't they changing, then you need to pray and then have that conversation with that person in humility seeking to understand and go, help me understand, are you, are, do you need help in this area? I notice that you're still struggling in it, and I don't say that in self-righteous, but I just want to help you. Are you praying? Are you reading? God, God says he doesn't show favoritism. You can do this. You can change. See what I'm saying? In verse 1 it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that they will not grow weary and lose heart. You fix your eyes on Jesus and Jesus alone. And then if you fix your eyes on somebody else, it's going, Jesus, how can I be of service to that person? Yeah. Then you fix your eyes back on Jesus. And then if you fix your eyes on someone else, it's like, Jesus, is there any way I'm supposed to be used to help that person? Or are they going to help me, maybe? Yeah. Yeah. And then you fix your eyes back on Jesus. Amen. And the only reason you look at anybody else and you see something that's wrong is like, God, how can I help them? I'll first pray for them. Am I supposed to get involved or what should I do? Because I'm, I'm, I'm the worst of the worst, so I just want to help anybody if I can because your grace lets me. Amen. The shame, Jesus had the same, he overcame the same shame as that woman did going to him. Yeah. That woman had so much shame and courage to walk into that room and get on her knees and wash his feet. Yeah. He, scorning its shame of the cross, went down the worst and had the worst punishment. It's usually a filthy criminal, dirty, wrong. And he did a disgraceful death and didn't worry about what people thought. And a lot of people condemned him and thought he was a freak and a loser and a demon. Right. He still did it, scorning it. God wants me to do this, I'm doing it. Right. So guys, fix your eyes on Jesus. Grace is our greatest teacher. Grace is... If you really have grace, it will divinely influence you to be like Jesus. It won't force you. It won't threaten you. It will influence you. You should be eager to change if the divine miracle and blessing of grace has touched you. I encourage those here that are seeking and wanting to know more answers of the scriptures and 
maybe ask themselves, did I really ever study the Bible on all these questions? Get with the person. Talk to them. Talk to me. Yes. We love studying the Bible. I study it every day anyway because I need to have my brain washed every day by God's word. Let's end in a prayer and then let's have the song leaders come up.